Hey guys, welcome to the Co Travel Podcast. I'm Bob Piercy, and today I'm talking with uh, someone who I've known for a long, long time, at, and I think she's a tremendous asset in the dental industry. And her name is Teresa Smith. Teresa, hey, thank you for doing this so much. Um, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so grateful that you thought of me to come on to your little. I don't even know what you call this a vlog. But well, this is actually this is actually going to be officially a podcast. So we're doing the Zoom call right now. We're recording the video. I'm still going to send that out. Still going to make that available. That's why I'm dressed to my nines. That's why you're why you're looking good. Uh, but we are going to take the audio of this. We are going to have it posted up on iTunes, Spotify, um, and then there's even like Google Podcasts, and so people can download this. So hey, who knows? There could people be people around the world listening to this uh, in a, in the not too distant future. So. Um, be on your best behavior. Um, let's have some fun. But this is, uh, yeah, this is this is this is going to be a great time. I, the reason I wanted to talk to you, Teresa, about this is my whole purpose for this is I want this to be really educational and value based. I don't want this just to be strictly selling because that's not what I want to do with this. I don't think people would be interested in hearing about that. Um, but I really want to try to drive uh, some value to my clients and to people that are listening in the dental industry. And I see you with a very interesting perspective. Um, and basically, I've known you for 10 plus years now, I guess. And you started off in a practice. It was a very small practice, rural practice. You were with that practice for, for many, many years, helping grow. And I would say being a vital part of growing that practice to um, you know, be, really being a, a powerhouse of a clinic. Um, you then you know, broadened your horizons. You actually you spent time working for a, a medium-sized, good-sized DSO, dental service organization. And so you have the, that corporate perspective. And now you're working in the, in the specialty market. And so really, you've got three very distinct perspectives on the dental industry, where most people that work in this industry really have, have one or two at the most. And I think, you know, there's a lot of questions out there about dentistry, the state of dentistry in Alberta, in Canada, um, in COVID, post-COVID. And I, I think you have, you know, the, the, the boots on the ground experience to kind of really shine some light on this. So no pressure, um, <laughs> but that's what I'm expecting. That's what I want to see from you in, in this conversation, okay? Awesome. Well, yeah, like you said, I've had kind of an interesting career into dentistry. Um, I didn't know I loved dentistry. I got tricked into into doing it um, by my friend and then was a boss, obviously, um, at that rural practice. And uh, I'd still tease him to this day about that, how he tricked me into, into working for him. But yeah, it was, it's been a whirlwind of a kind of career that I wasn't expecting, um, but I just absolutely love and um, kind of grew a passion for. And it sounds a little bit ridiculous, but I just feel like when you love what you do, it doesn't feel like work. And that's essentially, and there's hard days, but I love it. Like, even when it's a bad day, I kind of just like love the drama of it. I love the <laughs> engagement of it. And, and yeah, I just, I like to grow practices. That's all I do. And that's kind of where I focus my time, 99% of my time. Well, and I, I take actually special uh, pride in knowing that some of those bad days have been at my expense <laughs> or because of me. And I'd like you to take it's a so minute. True. <laughs> so, I can't tell you how many times and to the people listening to this <laughs> I have yelled at Bob and I feel so like I'm surprised we're even still friends to this day because situations get you know in a dental practice when things get rough and and as you're growing a practice it can be a little bit stressful um and yeah Bob ha had been my venting uh kind of escape a couple of times and I feel bad but at the same time, you know what we did, we grew, like I helped grow that practice, but Bob supported me like that whole time when we went through those ups and downs. And, and I'm sure some of it was not easy for him, but <laughs> I sure appreciated him when he was helping us out. So it was good. And I, I was able to kind of, you know, vent it off and then get back to work. And okay. So that there's one cool. thing, there's one story that you've told me that I want you to tell right now is <laughs> probably the most mad you were at me. What did you do? in regards to this venting so are you talking about the picture yes i'm talking about the well, picture i just shared that story with my new clinic and i was like let me tell you a story <laughs> <laughs> so one day one day bob had particularly made me mad and i don't know if you guys all know this but bob used to be the poster child for henry shine <laughs> and so and legitimately was the poster child so he was on this poster and we i don't even know how we got it mailed to us or something and we hung it up in our in i sent it to all my clients was, 
the size of a closet, our lab in our first clinic. And it was so just not very nice. And so we hung up on our bulletin board and it took up the majority of the bulletin board. I think it was like 11 by 14. I was so mad at him because something went out with our sterilizer and he couldn't get us a loaner like that day. And we're rural practice. So obviously like not even possible, but um, I drew devils, <laughs> drew devils, uh, you know, horns on his head and a mustache. And then, and then we threw tacks at him. <laughs> or, or pens or something. Yeah. Or so. pens or something. Yeah. We threw sharp objects at him and we all just kind of vented it off and it was just, and then he came in a while back late. Oh, no, did you see the picture? I can't even remember. If I don't think I ever, no, I, I didn't hear about this. I think story. I just like, told you the story. Like a couple, yeah. you, you told me the so story a couple a years ago. Yes. Expense, so anyways, just for people, you know, this is, this is a, this is a well-earned conversation. There's, um, <laughs> and there, there's depth here. And if, if we were able to get through that, you know, I think we're able to get through anything. So, uh, um, <laughs> anyway, so Teresa, like, I guess, yeah, like you're now kind of doing your own consulting thing now. Yeah. I'm still working in the industry. Um, Optimized Dental is the, the name of your, your company, your organization. And yeah. you're really taking a look on, on the business end, the front desk, the management of a practice. Cause so many other people are looking at hygiene and production and billings and that would be, but, but they're looking on the, 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 the clinical side you're really putting the microscope on, on the business side, the, the front desk and the management of that practice. Yeah, essentially, because um, where, like what I learned, you know, working in DSO and particularly in the one I was at was we put a lot of focus on our office management. And um, the reason we did that was because they're kind of like the head of that household and they're able to, um, if, if you have a good effective leader in that, clinic, then the dentist can really focus on doing dentistry and dentists are great at doing dentistry um, and running the clinical side. I mean, that's just what they excel at. That's what they went to school for. That's what they do. But um, office managers, if they're doing really well and can lead a team really well, um, they're the ones that help grow that practice. And I think that's why my very first clinic was such a success is because I had a really good relationship with um, the primary practitioner and and we would spend, you know, 20 minutes recapping the day every day and um, going, what, what went wrong? What went right? And, and with that, um, I mean, I wasn't privy to all of his financial information or anything, but he just said, like, listen, this is what I want to see. And then I, you know, the next week would make it happen. And so um, I think just being a good, effective leader or having good, effective leadership in that role um, and then allowing them to, you know, um, engage in that role is really where, where a lot of people don't spend a lot of time. And we've seen that kind of unlock in our practices at that DSO I worked at, because that's the key that those office managers are really the key, but there's not really a lot of education being um, around office management either. And so there's a real gap in, in knowledge base there that they can't, um, gain extra information. And so that's partly why I left the practice that rural practice. I, I love them and they're great. And to this day, I still get my dentistry done there. Like the difference was I wanted to learn and grow, but there was nothing. I couldn't take a course that was going to be more information that I did. I couldn't um, learn more. So I went into um, DSO so that I could learn more the finances and the and all that extra stuff because they really spend a lot of time engaging in that and so when I went into that DCO I, DSO I just really try to soak up as much information as I could so that I can apply that into um I knew eventually I wanted to go into either consulting or just working at another practice and building that a practice up or I yeah I didn't really have exactly planned out where I wanted to be but I just knew I wanted to keep growing practices so yeah I just kind of fell into this roll and and I'm just rolling with it because that's what we do in 21 2021 <laughs> now I guess we just day by day and you know it's a new our new normal I guess you could call it yes the the, the 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 dreaded term of 2020 of the the new normal um, yeah. but you're, you're I think you're so right because you know just um historically dental practices really have been you know ground up you know organic organizations starting from you know a very small clinical team and maybe maybe one or two people at, at the front and then they generally grow and then they generally um, would, you know, hire and promote from within. And so you might get an assistant who's tired of assisting and they want to go work at the front. And, and really the, um, 
the the scope of knowledge that's and people obviously learn and, and and are able to develop and thrive in roles but again the the scope of knowledge that is in the clinic has kind of always been in the clinic and it's very rare that um outside um information and, and education gets injected into those practices and all you know what to do is what you've done or what the person did before you and again three percent of the world's population are entrepreneurs um and then would you, and I've always kind of been under the impression that most dentists get into dentistry because they want to, you know, you know help patients and they want to you know, deliver care and, and make people feel better. And, but they're being forced into this entrepreneurial role. And then I think evident is the fact that the, the DSO market is growing is obviously a sign that, you know, there's a lot of dentists out there that aren't comfortable owning practices or aren't, aren't comfortable, you know, in that position and they want someone else to take care of it and run it for them so they can do what they've been trained to do which is which is do dentistry so i think a, a role like yours to help them focus on the, the front end office and again take your experience from the rural practice growth from the dso world from the uh the specialty world to really bring that education and that information to a practice i think um i, I think it's a great a great opportunity yeah and i i it's funny that you say it just like that because it was interesting as i took on this new role that i'm in um, the anxiety level of, of the primary practitioner is, was through the roof. Cause like, he just, he just wants to do dentistry and, and that really causes a lot of anxiety when you have to focus your time. And then if you don't have anything left to give at the end of the day, after doing a full day of dentistry, which we know can be quite physically, mentally, and emotionally demanding, um, you know, patients really, they, they suck the life out of you sometimes. And, and at the end of the day, it's, you don't have anything left and then you're supposed to focus on your practice and the business end. And, and just being in that practice for a short period of time and saying, hey, you know what, like I got this, I can take care of this for you, um, has relieved a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety and then and allowing them to see potential, which wasn't, you know, you get kind of narrow minded when you're stressed and have anxiety, you don't tend to look at opportunity anymore. You can't focus on like the good things that are happening, you just focus more and more negative and that increases anxiety and, and we see that a lot in dentistry, we see that a lot just because, like you said, they just they want to be dentists and, and that's okay. That's that's why they went to school and good for them. And, and the dental schools don't really provide a huge amount of business advice or business classes to like support that end. And I think they're trying to now, they're really making some leaps and bounds in that direction. Um, but for right now, for those that are still practicing right now, I think you're right. It's, it's, it's a struggle to give all you got in the, in the career that you have and then being forced into that entrepreneurial role to really kind of grow your practice. Um, it's, it's hard if you don't have the right team or the right setup to support it. Yeah, and, and touching on the universities, as I understand it, um, you know, there, there, are, there are a number of classes, it's generally, but it is in the, the last year of dentistry. And, um, and really then if you go and associate for two or three or four years out of practice, not being an owner, not thinking of those things, not using that information you learned, um, really it's, it's outdated by the time you become an owner and or it's completely forgotten and really, um, it's just it's it's there's not enough but again how do they how do they learn more because again their their plate is already so full just trying to become a dentist um it is early 2021 right now it is january it is the season of uh, resolutions and people reinventing themselves personally professionally i guess you know this is kind of a you know a thing for for businesses too they want to kind of how do they recover from 2020 how do they continue their current momentum hopefully it's upward momentum uh, through 2021 and everyone's already talking about 2022 being another that, that's when it, we can all relax and kind of take a breath um what do you think offices really need to be looking at right now and I, I know this is kind of a general scope but like what should they be looking at for 2021 to really make sure that this year goes in the right direction oh that's a loaded question <laughs> <laughs> what really Weird. There's so many things, um, but I think a few things, a few simple things, and and obviously I can't really get into nitty gritty because every office is, the dynamic is completely different and you cannot treat every office with the same you know, stroke of the brush, right? Every, every office has a different dynamic because every dentist is different and runs it differently in the personality types and the teams that they have, right? So the culture set the tone for what, what you're doing, but there are a few things that I think 
um, that dental practices could be a lot better at and kind of focus in on. And part of that is I know at COVID um, kind of we left for a short time during the COVID break, right? And most clinics were shut down. They didn't have PPE and whatever. And I think DSOs did a really fantastic job of like trying to remain open and getting PPE and stuff. And they had just the buying power and the opportunity to do that, which is great. Um, but single practices um, or smaller practices really struggled to do that. And the one thing that DSOs did when they came back online was they completely restructured their clinics. And I think that that is what separated um, single practices from DSOs and why some of the DSOs that came through and out of that were far more successful than single practices because when they came back, they, they only limited their staff costs. They made sure to keep the eye on um, what they were doing and how much how much production was coming in, and how much staff how much staff costs I guess were going out, um, and they were also keeping a close eye on um, just maintaining um, the little nuances. And so they were saying like, oh, you know, we're not opening for a full uh, eight hours. We're opening for five hours, and we're only bringing this many staff in for that day. Um, what I think is when a lot of single practices or sole practices came online, they were just saying, oh, the whole team's back. And, and so I think that just being more conscious of your staff costs, and I know that's probably every employee out there is probably wants to throw darts at me right now, like <laughs> I did with Bob, but at the same time, you know, protecting your practice adds longevity um, to your practice, which keeps people employed. Um, and we, because we don't really know what's going on and we all know that this economic situation we're in is a bit, you know, turbulent, we just want to make sure that you're keeping a close eye on those staff costs. And, and I think the ones that have kept a close eye on them and haven't brought all their staff back, maybe necessarily, or, um, or maybe have cut back on their hours and stuff are are now finding, and I'm hearing down the grapevine, and because I'm still working in clinic, um, I'm hearing quite a bit about how they're feeling very overworked. And I think that's because everyone went back to work doing their bubble job that they did before COVID. And because dentistry has now significantly changed the way we operate, you can't go back to the way things were. And I think um, especially with the clinics that I was managing during COVID, <clears throat> every person that got back, we hopped on a phone call that when we brought them back and said, listen, this is not the same dentistry that you left. We are doing things differently. This is because we don't want to make, we want to make your lives better, not harder. If we come back to the same way we were, that we're going to be shorthanded and things are going to be doing. So we, we restructured our clinic as the demand came and we slowly built it back up over a six or eight week period. Whereas I think a lot of single practitioners really have built their practice over a 10 year period and then I struggle to rebring it back and build it back in a short period of time. And so mm -hmm. we spent um, a lot of time and it was a lot of painstaking effort when we brought those our clinics back online. Um, to make sure that we structured it back and then grew those clinics really fast so that we can get everyone back to where they were going. But not every person that came back was doing the same job. We were doing the, the same position in a different way. And so that's why they're being more a little successful and why I think some practices are really struggling right now. So if we can focus on restructuring that front end or maybe it is clinical depending on how you're running it, depending on how, um, you know, how you your patient flow coming in and out of the clinic and your production um, reflects that but yeah we're just really focusing on restructuring what's going on and it's okay to restructure mm -hmm. at this point because it's really going to save you down the road you know um, one thing you're talking about just just bringing an analogy and an example from outside the dental industry uh, i've got a friend of mine who's in the construction business and years ago, I remember him talking and saying there's it was a downturn in the economy, things were tough, and he had had a, a great team that worked for him, and they did their best. They took on jobs at really low margin just to try to keep their guys employed, their their people employed, because they wanted to keep that team and they wanted to uh, you know and support them. But they they barely barely survived as a company during that time. And what he said he later learned as as a business owner was that the most important thing is for the business to survive. And so then the second time, you know, another downturn came in, in their industry. 
you know, they did not do that. They did not take on, you know, jobs at really low margin in order to keep everyone employed and going through because, you know, if the company becomes a casualty, well, then everyone loses, not just the employees, but now the owners, now the owners' families, where really it is, a, a, the business needs to survive. And I, I, I think I think you're right. I've seen examples and heard of examples where exactly what you said has happened, where the whole team has come back and and the, the office is struggling and trying, and, and, you know, and of course, like, I, I'm not an employer, so I don't have, the, I don't feel the responsibility of, of an employee's, you know, mortgage payment or car payment or, or kids, you know, piano lessons. And I, I could get how an employer would have that. But at the same time, um, you really need to take care of your, your business first. That needs to survive. And once that's surviving and thriving, then it can grow. And then we can bring back the entire team or more because we're, we put ourselves in a position to be successful as opposed to becoming a casualty of, of, of the environment altogether. So, well, yeah. And I think like what you said, I mean, obviously as a big corporation, we were trying to bring back everyone that we possibly could because we want to grow too. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But as a corporation, you can do things a little differently because it's not personal. Um, Everyone knows when you work for a corporation, it's a lot less personal. Um, When you work for a dentist, it's like, I work beside this person every day. And so it is quite difficult to be like, I'm not bringing you back. Um, But showing a lot of empathy in telling someone that and being clear and say like, I don't know what I can offer you. I don't know what's going to happen right now. And this is where I'm at. And I, I would love to have you here, but it's not possible. I mean, that's just as part of owning a practice and that's part of um yeah like you said protecting your business and and yeah that person might be upset for a short period of time and and that's just what's going to happen and and it's not personal it really you kind of have to do separate yourself from the the business at that point because you're going to have to make some hard decisions and hard decisions are hard decisions and Mm -hmm. you stick with them and you just know that getting your business on track and then come down the road if that person's still available maybe you can bring them back and maybe you don't need them back and you just don't know until you kind of make those choices but but yeah taking a close look at that information and and what your production is versus what your staff costs are is is really important um at this stage in the game because you need to think about longevity if something happens and we get shut down again can you afford to go through two weeks without production or you know, we're seeing practices now where they're, you know, someone gets COVID. I just heard the other day, another practice shut down in Edmonton because a staff member got COVID. Um, and, you know, those staff members share lunchrooms and on mass. So then AHS says, shut it down. The entire clinic gets shut down. Well, can you afford to lose two weeks of production because a staff member gets COVID? Um, and you're doing the best things you can for your patients and you're following AHS. And those are kind of things like you all protect yourself from. So um, making sure that you are able to afford it long-term is really kind of what we're looking at now, which is totally new for everyone, but especially new for dentists because we've always been in the kind of more of a luxury business where we had a bit of a cushion before and now we don't have that. Yeah, um, just this is gonna seem kind of bizarre and random, but. I was listening to a podcast the other day, actually yesterday, and it was, the person being interviewed was telling a story about how they met um, a U.S. military personnel who was, I think, if I get this right, it was this person spent seven years in a POW camp um, in Korea, and this was one of the highest-ranking U.S. officials that was, you know, in a POW camp, and this guy survived the seven years and is now teaching and talking about the whole situation. And anyways, the guy asked, like, who didn't make it? Who had the most trouble with it? And the answer was the optimists, because the optimistic people are going to say, oh, we'll be out of this by Christmas, we'll, we'll be out of this by Easter, and then, you know, Christmas and Easter pass, oh, we'll be out of this by Christmas. And the, the, the biggest struggle was that there was no end date, you had no idea, like if you go, if you get sentenced to jail for committing a crime, you're, you're in jail for five years, you can start putting marks on the wall until you get out. And you can do the countdown for this, it was just, it was an open slate. And you know, I've even caught myself in this whole COVID time being like, oh, like, hey, Christmas or, you know, I've caught myself doing that. But really, like, it's, it's an infinite game. And so um, for this person's opinion, how he survived, his survival was based on the fact that he knew he was going to get out of it. And getting out of it and being free um, from this POW camp was going to be his reward. And that was going to be his greatest moment. And he's looking forward to that 
And it didn't matter when that happened. He just had to know that he just had to, had to survive. He had to get through it and he was going to get out of this. And then that would be his moment. And I think, you know, we're all being optimistic now. We want, you know, there's vaccines on the horizon. It's coming, it's being distributed now. You know, when we're talking, you know, maybe, maybe the summer, maybe the fall. I think dentistry is like low on the list too. So I, and, it's going to be a while for sure. Yeah. And so, you know, we just need to realize that and just like, you know, you want to be optimistic, but be realistic and realize that we're in this, we need to get through this most important thing is that we do get through this. And when we get through this, when we get through this, that's when we can celebrate and 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 be proud of what we've been able to do. Um, so that's just kind of my, my weird tangent on on this well, whole thing. I just out of curiosity, I'm going to sidebar this just a touch more. Okay, please. <laughs> that the guy that remembered every single person's name? Was that that same you know, I don't know that part of the conversation oh, wasn't discussed. I, I heard of it. It sounds very similar. Maybe it's the same guy. I don't know. But he he memorized every single person um, that was like captain captive. And now they're all being charged for like, whatever. War crimes or war something. crimes or whatever it is. Yeah, I know. It's, it's interesting. I'm pretty sure it's the same guy. But yeah, it's, it's a great story. I mean, I mean great story because we can sit here in our comfortable homes and listen <laughs> to this. Remember, but like, he is, his uh, consistency and mindset was just amazing. And I think, I think that can be applied into, you know, business or just your own personal mindset and in your own personal life in general, mm -hmm. like the goal, the goal is a goal and how you get there is how you get there. We just got to keep going at it. Right. Like it's just keep being resilient at, at making mistakes and learning and growing and, and kind of just keep pushing forward. I mean, like, like the first clinic I worked at and how many, I can't, like, I can't even tell you how many bumps we went over. Um, I think the first week we opened our brand new clinic, our beautiful, beautiful <laughs> brand new clinic. We didn't have phones because the, the phone company wouldn't drill the line. And they said they would have it done. I had, we had booked them for like six months in advance, like way more, like, they, oh yeah, we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. I never got to it. So the, we used, uh, our dentist had purchased a, an iPhone. I think it was like an iPhone four even. <laughs> um, that's how old I am. <laughs> but yeah, so it was an iPhone and we used the iPhone as the clinic phone for like, I want to say a month. And <laughs> yeah, it, it was just funny. And yeah, it's just things like that where, you know, you, you just push through and it's unfortunate and those things happen and life, you know, gives you unexpected twists and turns, but you just be creative and make do and keep pushing forward. We knew that we would get there. Um, and I think, I think that's the hardest part about owning a business or, you know, building a practice is knowing that you can get there. Um, and pushing through when you don't have the experience or wisdom to rely on. And I think that's what, coming back to where we were before. I feel like full circle is, is frustrating when you don't know what to do. I've right. never lived through that. Right. And, and, and it's a guessing game and those new things can be very scary. And so, you know, relying on someone who maybe has gone through it or has a little bit more expertise than you to like push through for that is, is kind of, it's kind of a great thing right now to be able to just even poke a question or <clears throat> get some feedback because it's, yeah, like I think a lot of people are learning. Some people are learning faster than others. It's just, it's a, it's a hard game right now. And, and again, it's, it's, it's a thing of exposure. What have you been exposed to and what can you draw on? And again, that's what just, I'm just, I'm so impressed with what you've done over your career and um, the, the, the very, very small part that I've played in it. And again, most of it being a pain in the butt is what I've done. <laughs> But again, I, I just think it's just, um, again, I, when I, I look at what you do, what you've done, the, 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 again, the arrows in your quiver, whatever you want to use the analogy for like the, you know, the, the tools that you have, again, I just think it's, um, I, I think you're just in a, in a great place. And I think any practice that, you know, w wants to draw on that is just, is going to, is going to benefit. Um, the other thing I was going to say too, is like, um, going back on, on business and failure and just, you know, again, I'm using air quotes, they, because no one knows who they are, but if they, yeah. they say that. <laughs> you know, it's people don't, people don't fail. Companies don't fail. Ideas don't fail. It's, 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 they, they quit whoever is, is driving it. And, and again, it's, it's like you talk about this. I think failure is great. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You fail, you learn. Right. Like I can't tell you how many times we've failed. 
I can't tell you how many patients have walked out the door after talking to me. Like it happens. You fail at things, but guess what? You learn when you fail. You don't learn when it's easy, like failure. And it doesn't matter how much, like, I don't know. I think I read thing the other day and was like, oh, failure, something about failure, but it was like, doesn't matter how far you drop. It matters how high you bounce. So <laughs> yeah, you, you drop, but guess what? You can bounce back up. And now you're starting again with a huge amount of mindset and knowledge that you didn't have previously. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, just the audio cut out a little bit there. It's just, it's, it's unfortunate, oh, but sorry. You, do you want me to recap? You were on a roll, uh, <laughs> but it was all, it was all great. Um, no, it's all good. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's the resilience factor. It's, it's getting up, it's doing it. And again, I agree, um, you know, failure is important. And again, but again, it's, you're not guaranteed to learn from it, you know, and, and there's the other, the other saying again that they say is, you know, you're going to relive the same mistakes until you actually learn from it. And so it, there is a, a plateauing effect that people have and businesses have, you know, if they aren't able to, to learn from, from the mistakes they've made in the past. Um, now, one of the other things that you touch on again, the, right now, DSO is, you know, definitely a, a big powerhouse in our, our industry. You talked earlier about some of the advantages that they had in regards to, um, you know, recovering and, and managing the, the COVID uh, shutdown and, and recovery. And, you know, I've even heard stories of, of, of DSOs over this time, you know, talking to, you know, privately owned GP saying like, you need us to buy you, you need us to take you over because you're not going to survive this. Um, and whether how true that is, but, but again, the, the story's out there. Now, I see a need for DSOs. I, I do. And there's obviously there's a, there's, there's a need for it because if there was no need, doctors wouldn't sell to a DSO. There's, a portion, there's a portion of doctors that, that and I, I, know, I know doctors that have, have become partnered with DSOs and have thrived under it because of it. Um, but again, a DSO, I don't believe is, is the answer for everybody. I don't think that all offices are going to be DSO run in the near future or anytime soon, um, ever. But like, what are, again, going back to your experience, you know, um, what are the pros to a DSO? What are the challenges? What, what do they face? What, what's their Achilles heel? So that, because again, I've talked to GPs owning their practice and they're like, hey, I don't care about the doctor across the street that owns his own practice. I'm not considering him or her to be my competition. My competition is the DSO that's coming into the market. So what's the Achilles heel to those, those companies? And how does a, a doctor you know, running their own practice, how do they compete and, and thrive against that Goliath? Yeah, so it does feel like a bit of a Goliath, right? And, and I think it's funny that you mentioned Goliath because David slew Goliath with a rock, with a pebble. And I feel like, I feel like it is simple things very simple things that can set you apart as a as a sole practice versus a DSO and a DSO they do things some things really well like they are data driven um, practices which means they spend a lot of time on business and they see well this is where the numbers are telling us it's not emotional or intuitive learning it's like oh I think this is what's happening so we're doing it it's like no this is what the finances are telling me and this is how we're going to maximize on these finances. Um, so you get a lot more of that kind of virtual or like picture look is more financial driven. Um, and then the other thing is they're very good at consistency and accountability. Um, so they have a goal and they stick with it and they push through and they have consistency. And then once they meet that goal, they maintain it here and then they add something else. And then they sit and sit and drill and drill and drill. And then they bring the level up and then they start on there. And so they do do a, you know, a lot of accountability and consistency, which helps their practices grow. It's short term over a long period of time because DSOs are long game thinkers though. So their, their career is not a 20 year career like a dentist their career is we're holding on to this practice 50 years because they're long-term gains. So if they see a 1% increase over the year, great. They've increased that practice 1%. Whereas a dentist has a shorter amount of time that they need to hold that investment. And so they need to see more production out of it because that's their retirement plan. Um, so that's kind of the things that they do differently. 
Um, the other thing that they're very good at is communication. Um, so they communicate fairly well verbally written. They communicate, they give a lot of direction and they give a lot of what their expectations are so that you can and their employees reach their expectations. So in that regard, those are the things that they do really well, but the things that can kind of undercut them, I guess, or you can measure in those gaps are um, they don't build, spend a lot of time building culture in their clinics. So they don't have the employees um, that stick around for long periods of time. Um, there's a few that do, don't get me wrong. There's always like the one-offs, but, but really sole practitioners, they have the advantage when it comes to building their culture and, and making their team and their clinic great. Um, and then the other things that they don't do very well is um, their social media presence and the way they project themselves in the communities. <clears throat> and that doesn't seem like it should add a lot of value, but it does, it's huge. And so right now you think about everyone being stuck at home and what are they doing? I mean, 90%, I can tell you right now, all of like, I have 15 year old and a 14 year old and like, they're like this. <laughs> I don't even know what their face looks like most of the time, right? Their hands in front of their face with their phone all the time for those who are listening and not watching. Right. But yeah, so their phones are in front of their face or they're watching an iPad or they're playing video games, right? And, and so social media is going to be huge over the next five, 10 years. That's how you're going to connect with these groups of people. Um, and I think people like millennials, even in like my age group, which I feel super old, but yeah, so my age group, the people that shouldn't be on TikTok, but are, <laughs> are, are the ones that like are, you know, you're engaging those, those are the people that are coming into your clinic. And so I think just, I think a lot of corporations send out social media blasts and they post repetitive things about sales but social media is just this it's social media and so engaging with your audience and building your audience on social media is like a huge advantage um and put you know organic posts and i follow a huge amount of dental clinics and it's very interesting to me to watch what goes on across um the social media platforms um, because they're posting um, some posts like, you know, informational and educational. And I think that should be about 10% of what you post in your thing, because everyone knows they need to brush their teeth. Everyone knows they need to uh, floss every day. I mean, I think that's been drilled into our brains for the most part yes. here, especially in Canada. I still don't do it every day, but yes, it has been drilled into my brain that I should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your mom was a good mom. Um, <laughs> or your dental hygienist, one or the other. Um, and then I think like organic posts need to make a huge comment like into that play. And, and I think that's where they don't do well. And, and I think the DSO that I worked at did things a little bit differently and they did focus a lot on the office managers. A lot of DSOs don't, they don't educate, they don't educate their team. And I think that is a huge downfall because if you are educating your team, you get buy-in. And when you get buy-in, you can change anything in your practice. If you're like, you know what, today we're doing it this way. And they're like, let's roll with it, right? Because the team is engaged and wants it. Um, engagement is huge. And so if you don't have culture, you don't get engagement because people are just showing up to collect a paycheck. And right. we don't want those people, I mean, we want them to be engaged. We don't want those people just sitting in our clinic because they're not the ones going the extra mile for your patient. They're not the one coming up with new ideas. I mean, dentistry has changed, like I said before, where now we have to do things differently and you have to be engaged. You have to be engaged on social media, texting. If you're a sole practitioner and you are not texting your patients, you're underutilizing a huge amount of things like just to grab their attention right so i think those are things that like i think every practice could look at right now and where you could see some serious gains just changing some simple things in what you do every day and i know that's a little bit extra right you're gonna have to do that outside of your office hours but it's important because that's where you make your advantage you're a real person and i think there's one clinic in edmonton that has like 1500 followers right and they post fun things. They post TikToks. They yeah. post like just everyday things that happen. Oh, like this is, you know, funny shoe day and they're all wearing funny shoes or like 
whatever, you know, like it's just simple things that make them engaged and they've built that up over a huge amount of time. But like that's, you can start now because in five years from now, if you start in five years from now, it's too late. Yeah, you're, I, I agreed completely. And the interesting thing and the thing I, I, I see and I kind of imagine people kind of um, resisting to what you just said is the fact that it's it's not hard. It's in, 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 it's it's not a, not a, you know, like solid business strategy. Like we're going to go and like, it, it, it sounds kind of soft. It, it sounds mm-hmm. kind of like, like, you know, like lazadaisical and, and stuff as opposed to like a strong, like, you know, business development plan. And it's, you know, but, but what you're talking about is it's hard to compete again, the, the Goliath analogy, it's hard to fight that fight. So let, let, let's flank it from another side. Let's find another area and a, and a, a strength and opportunity that, that a, a solo practicing office has over a G over, over a DSO is the fact that they're an individual. And I still get a kick out of how, you know, a lot of dental practices that are solo, solo owned, their websites are completely generic. It's stock photos, it's, it's fake people, it's not the team, it's not the doctor, it's not the doctor's family who are being featured in this. So you're not gonna see that person, that man, woman, or child at the clinic because they're just, again, it was a, a stock photo. Like take the advantage to really personalize your message, get out in front and, 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 and you, like you say, social media, actual like um, um, organic natural content that again features you and your team that really drives you because again I think that's something that you can control in that practice so it's really interesting that that's what you said I I, I agree with it um, as, as being a big opportunity and yeah no I think that's I think that's a, a really really well overlooked point because again it's so simple you think that it, uh, how do you compete against this you have to come up with some like, big massive scheme when in reality it's like you say it's it's the little things that you can do that they just simply can't because they are going to have higher turnover because they, they they have they struggle with culture and buy-in and and again it's a less engaged dental team and again this isn't all of them but this is you know this is a a symptom of of, of, of a lot of dso's that we've seen and you know, you know, utilize your strengths as your team, who you are as a, as a doctor, as an individual, and really drive that. Because again, it is still a very, very personable profession where people want to sit down, they want to talk to the dentist, they want to be comfortable with their dentist, with their hygienist, with the assistant. They want to feel like they're being taken care of. They don't want to feel like I've, this is a, you know, the third different dentist or the third different hygienist that I've seen coming in here. So that is a true opportunity for a solo owned practice. And it's free. Yeah, absolutely. You're, it yeah. costs you nothing but your time. And I know that you're like the dentist. And if whoever dentists are listening to this are just shaking their head right now, probably like, I'm not doing that. I'm not creating a video. You don't have to. I can tell you something right now. <laughs> you guaranteed you probably have a young DA. You probably have a young receptionist that is all over Instagram and TikTok and whatever. And like literally put them in charge of it and just say everything needs to be vetted through me before it goes online. Yep. Take a picture. Let me know what you're going to do. Show me what it is. And then we scroll it out. Have and some fun. Then once they get, you know, uh, engaged with it and rolling with it, and then it becomes less and less effort for you in the beginning, because they know where they're allowed to send, but like um, empowering that person to be a part of your team and be like, come up with a TikTok, come up with it, whatever. And like, literally I just seen, it's just some of the things that I think would be funny, like to post and just some ideas, because I was thinking of like, uh, so we spend a lot of time building culture at my first clinic because we went from a very small core group. Is the sound coming through? All right. All right. You're, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so we, we had a, a small core group and then we had to expand very quickly when we built our next the expansion. Right. Um, and so we ended up in like an extra four or five people, you know, join our practice in a sh- short period of time. And so, um, I had talked with the primary dentist and I said, listen, like if we don't, there, there were, the teams were being very separate. And I said, if we don't get this under control, the, the OGs we're going to have rookies. issues. Exactly. Veterans, rookies. Yeah. And so we just, yeah. And so that's exactly what happened. And so we was, I said, we don't get this under control. We're going to have some problems. So every month we had a staff meeting and every staff meeting we had culture building. And so it was literally 10 minutes of time in the first part of our staff meeting. Cause we had like an hour and a half and half an hour of it was like eating lunch and just socializing. Um, and then we literally just spent 10 minutes of that first after lunch of just of doing something to team build. 
Mm -hmm. and just simple things. And then literally taking a picture of that and posting, yep, team building over our lunch period today, or hey, you know, Dr. So-and-so bought lunch today. Great place to work. So happy to have him here, blah, 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 snap. And not only are you engaging in, um, you know, culture and building back into your community and people loving to work at your clinic. Now, when you go to hire someone, they're going to look at your social media page and they're going to go, I like that clinic. They're scrolling through. I like that clinic. They're doing lots of fun things. I want to work there. And yeah. if they're a good candidate. So we're seeing a lot of people trying to hire people right now. And I know people are reaching out to me. Do you know someone, you know, here and here and I'm not trying to help place people and such. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, if it's easy sell. Yeah. Go, I'm like, oh, this clinic, they're like, ah, uh, yeah. Like I got 50 resumes. And then I go to another clinic and they're, and they're like, oh, you don't want to work at this clinic. They're like, yeah, no, I'm good. I don't want that clinic, you know? And so it's, it just helps build those things so that you can always have the right team. Mm -hmm. and and the right people in place because they're looking to be a part of something great and as we know millennials have changed the outlook of the world at this point when culture is so important to them and like who they work for why they're working those things those core beliefs I, and I'm included in that. I hate to say it, but <laughs> I'm included in that if I don't see value in the people I work for and I don't see value and I work for myself now, so I have to work on that. But if I don't see value, you know, in, in those things, I don't want to work for them. If, if I just, I just, I can't be bothered because right. I'm just, I want to be happy in my work day. And I don't necessarily mean they have to bring me happiness, but I, I don't want to go home stressed and exhausted and frustrated every day. No one does. We're over that. That stage has played this game the corporate lifestyle of like working 20 hour days and doing that just to get edgewise. And, you know, I think millennials have really trying to turn the page on that. And I think that's okay. Um, and, and if that's where we're headed, then us as business owners um, need to be reflective of that because that's where the attention is. And society kind of dictates a little bit where business is and that's where opportunity grows. Right. So. Hey, Teresa, you know what? I, I forgot to stop, start my stopwatch on this whole thing. All I know is we went way over time in regards to this is by far the longest conversation I've had on this. And so anyone that is, I, I really hope people stuck around because I really do think this is valuable stuff. I really hope they did find value in this. I think this- and You can I, edit it. Just cut it off. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to lose some of this stuff. Um, but you do have a website, you do have social media. I'll take all of your links later after this call. I'll include this when I send this out to my clients. Um, it is Optimized Dental, Teresa Smith. Um, and so I, I think we should do this again sometime. We can, uh, I think you and I could talk for forever. Um, and again, I, I really think this is, um, there's a lot here for people to, to digest. So uh, I, I think we should cut it off because it, it, we're just at that time. But um, yeah, for so, sure. I really appreciate this. This has been a good time. And the, yeah, we, we, you and I do get long winded, <laughs> <And, laughs> but yes. you know what? It's because we're passionate about what we do. And I, I can't feel bad about that. So thank you for this opportunity. It's been awesome. Well, Hey, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's do this again sometime soon. Yeah. Your, your passion is just, is, 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 is just clear as day. I, we, we all know that you, you love what you do and you want to make an impact. So again, thanks so much. We'll do this again. All again, people listening to this, I'll have Teresa's um, website, email, social, all connected into this uh, so you guys can check her out. Optimize Dental. Hey, have a great night, Teresa, and talk to you soon. Okay, bye for now. Okay, bye.